Okay. We're going to the Bible text if you need to. You might want to enlarge the display. Revelation chapter 20. We've got him, the devil bound for the thousand years. And then the all the great powers are gathered together. We have the holy ones reigning together with the Lord. The defeat of Satan. He's released from his prison. He goes with Gog and Magog. And then you have the great judgment before the great white throne. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. It would be beautiful to read right through it, but let me stop and, and, and notice some of these figures of speech. It is such a small comparison, but uh, think for a moment about uh, how many times you've heard somebody say on the news or, or, or in conversation now that the whole United States is stuck at home. Uh, what is, is the new world going to be like when we get out again? Uh, I saw a, a crawl on, on the news where somebody was, you know, tweeting into the news channel and said something about, well, will university students be back in, 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 in the universities in the fall? I thought, yes, I'd like to know that myself. Uh, how, how different will the world be after this? Because it really seems messed up right now. Well, people of every age have thought that, whether it was this particular plague, this a terrible disease in the world right now, or the world wars, or you can just go back through history and all the terrible times that people have suffered. And you wanna say, I'd like to just start all over. A new heaven and a new earth. I think about outside my window, about three houses down, you can see an empty lot. So we, this is a neighborhood of patio homes, so the house is pretty close together. But that empty lot, uh, not quite two years ago, I was sitting in my living room working on a lesson and heard a siren come right down our street. And I finally got up to notice, because you hear sirens all the time in the city, and there was a house on fire. I mean, the flames were like three stories tall and fire trucks everywhere. It was terrible to watch. And uh, we asked some of the passing firemen, was there anybody in the house? And they said, oh, everybody's out. Well, the sad thing is the next morning they found the body of the poor man who was an invalid and had his oxygen running when he was smoking and burned his house down. So every time I pass that empty lot, it's just, it's just sad. It'd be pretty much hard for me to imagine anybody building there. But if it was your old homestead, if you were somebody who suffered one of the recent tornadoes or, or, or the horrible uh, hurricanes of the past several decades, to see the new city would lift your spirit. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The others have passed away. And then that interesting phrase, and the sea was no more. I had trouble relating that. I like to see the sea. I like to go to the beach. The, no, he's talking about being out in the sea where the waves are taller than your ship and you don't know if you're going to survive. He's talking more particularly about the sea where the awful beast arose, where terrible things came and where there's constant threat. It's alluding to the crystal sea, to the perfectly smooth as glass clear as crystal waters before the throne of God. The evil sea is no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. A 
beautiful figure. Um, there's a picture here that I almost spilled on this morning, waiting to be hung up. It's a picture of when my son and I took my mother to her hometown uh, for the last time, and a uh, tiny little town of Dozier, Alabama. And she just left all sad because, I mean, the place is locked up. There's hardly anything left. It's a really sad looking little town. Can't imagine it reviving. Don't know how many times in my lifetime they've tried to revive downtown Montgomery and I think, well, that building worked and all the rest of it just looks old. To be able to get a fresh new start. What a wonderful idea. What a wonderful hope. And it's not just any city. It's Jerusalem. As we mentioned in a recent lesson, Jerusalem didn't exist when the book of Revelation was written. The Romans had conquered it back in about 70, and now it's like 95. They had built a Roman city there and didn't even call it Jerusalem anymore. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I do, of course, remember the day my bride was coming down the aisle. I remember the day I escorted my daughter down the aisle and then switched places and presided at her wedding. I don't know how many weddings I've done. <clears throat> but a bride adorned for her husband is a beautiful thing to see. And that's what is supposed to be wonderful new beginnings. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. This is a culmination of all that God has promised through the ages. This is what he promised to Israel. This is what he demonstrated when the tabernacle was in the middle of the camp of Israel and all of the tents surrounded the dwelling place of God. There were rules of how you had to behave because God was in your midst. We are warned in some of the epistles of the New Testament. You mustn't practice immoral behavior. God lives within you. But we know that not everyone is living as if God were in their midst. And there are seasons of history when it looks like God is far away. And there are seasons in our life that way. But when it all comes together, we're going to live with God in the right relationship. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, because the former things have passed away. I know that most of you have, maybe some of you haven't, experienced the loss of someone that you love very much. It's so hard. It stays with you. I, uh, I have a, a friend whose wife just died. And they could barely have a funeral because of what's going on. And I felt so sorry for them. You need that hug. You need somebody to wipe your tears away. And you don't always get it. The day is coming when God himself will wipe away our tears. There won't be any pain. We'll have all passed away. We take comfort in that when we lose a loved one who's been very sick or who suffered a traumatic injury. But it's talking about the whole world. No more mourning, crying, or pain. Verse 5. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. 
He said, write this down. These words are trustworthy and true. And he said, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. You know, that's the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. The beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Okay, I want you to notice again in verse 7 this repeated thing. It's about the reward to the conquerors. And the conquerors are the ones who kept the faith, who would not deny the Lord, who wouldn't give loyalty to the powers of this world by calling the emperor my Lord and my God. In that great promise, then, there is the other side. But as for the cowardly, and in first reference, it's talking about those who were not brave enough to keep the faith the faithless, the detestable, and then they're lumped in with all kinds of horrible sins. As for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And notice, it starts with the cowardly faithless. And the list ends with all liars. And yes, it is a sin to lie. But the great lie that is so much the focus of the book of Revelation is to lie by denying the lordship of Christ and that God reigns supreme. And as horrible as death is, there's a second death. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues. And he spoke to me and says, come and I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had great high walls with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates were the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel inscribed on all these gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Everything is now in the perfect number, the 12. Going down to how huge it is, it's all in perfect numbers. Uh, verse 19, the foundation of the wall of the city was adorned with every kind of jewel, jasper, sapphire, agate, emerald, onyx, carnelian, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, I don't know what chrysoprase is, jacinth, and amethyst. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each one made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. This part's important. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need for sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of the Lord gives it light. And its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of earth will bring their glory to it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's an all or nothing in the end. Either you're in or you're not. But if you're in, evil won't get you anymore. We may return to chapter 22 on Monday briefly, but let me hit the highlights. Jesus speaks. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must take place. And then the words of Jesus. Behold, I'm coming soon. 
Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And then John is told uh, to keep this in a book. Don't seal them up. The time is near. Um, and, and, and it's too late to make any changes. Verse 11, let the evildoer still do evil and the filthy still be filthy and the righteous still do right and the holy still be holy. In other words, there's going to come a time and there's no more changing. And then the Lord repeats, behold, I'm coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. It's wrapping it up, saying, yes, when it happens, it's going to happen quickly. When it ends, it's going to end for good. There is a warning in verse 18. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share. In the tree of life, in the holy city, which are described in this book. Certainly a principle we'd want to apply to every inspired word of scripture, but particularly applying to the book of Revelation. And then the conclusion. He who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And then John writes, of the Lord Jesus, be with all. Amen. Well, on Amen, we'll wrap up for today. I will very soon post for you a study sheet for the book of Acts, which will be your unit three exam. Uh, we'll do a review for that on Monday. We'll take that test on Wednesday. And we'll probably have time on both Monday and Friday to also review for the final exam. That's it for today. I'll be glad to take any questions or comments people have. If you don't have any, you can log out and we'll wrap it up for today.